Shubhavat, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and for me, it is such an honor to be here. Um, it's such an honor to be here. I actually want to start with what's usually the end, where I say, thank you. Um, it's, it's an honor for a number of different reasons. First of all, I know how difficult it is to get time off from work for something that's not obviously productive. Um, second of all, this conference is a very special conference for me because this is the first time that I've had the possibility to introduce, um, to introduce personal agility as a keynote at a conference. And for reasons that I'm going to explain in a moment, uh, I think it's very fitting that this take place in India. Now, before we go any further, there, there are two people who I really want to thank, and I hope they haven't left the room. Um, one of them is Piali, and the other is Saket. Are you around? Yeah, ah, there we are, right in front of me. Okay, so I'd like you both to stand up. I'd like everyone to give them a round of applause. Um, both for an excellent event, and also for being early champions of personal agility. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to introduce um, I'd like to introduce a concept, um, and th this is maybe a little bit of a digression, actually. This isn't really what I came to talk about, but this is perhaps the India connection to personal agility. And we've got two very important concepts up there, yes and no. And I first started working with um, Indian companies. I did my first training in Bangalore about four years ago. And one of the things I noticed when I came here is that yes somehow seemed to mean something different than what I thought it did, and I hardly ever heard the word no at all. Okay, does that ring any bells? Yes. And so it occurred to me much, much later that probably when you work with European or American companies or Asian companies, that yes probably means something different for them too. You probably hear no much more often. And, and so that was, if you will, one uh, one aspect of it. We had some great conversations, by the way, in my scrum classes. I asked about this. You know, why, why is this? And I, I was almost afraid to ask the question because I wasn't sure. You know, I, I didn't know much about Indian culture back then. I'm not saying I do now, but I knew even less then. And um, the, I, I was really surprised at how people were willing to discuss the question with each other and give me answers. And what they explained to me is that no is really a very dangerous word. No causes conflict. You might you take a risk when you say the word no. You might lose a customer. You might lose your reputation. Uh, so there are all kinds of th bad things that could happen when, when you say no. And so we need to be really careful about how we, how we use this word. Now, the other, um, the other aspect of yes and no, uh, I was giving a product owner course in Zurich. Has anyone seen the, the uh, Henry Kniebergs video, Agile Project, uh, sorry, Product Ownership in a Nutshell? Anyone familiar with the video? Okay, if any of you come to my product course, you'll, product owner course, you'll see it next week. Uh, and he talks about this, this hypothetical product owner named Pat. And one of the things that Pat does is she has to say no quite often because her stakeholders have so many brilliant ideas. And saying no is so important that she practices it in front of the mirror every day. Now, at the time that I was doing this class, you know, after we after we learned something like this, I would ask people to write down what I call their aha moments, things that are really special that they remembered from the video. And now, most of my people in Switzerland, they're either Swiss or they might be German, or sometimes I get some Italians and some Swedes. I do my courses in English, so I get a very international group. And most of them are most of them, you know, they write down. No, this no thing is really exciting for them. Wow, I get to say no. Oh my God, I've got to say no. Am I really allowed to say no? And in this one class, I had two people. Um, I believe they were from India. I'm not 100% positive, but I, but I think so. Um, in any case, the guy wrote down on his aha moment, sometimes it's better to say yes and prioritize down. And I looked at this. And I said, wait a minute. Did he understand what the video was about? And, and so I, you know, without, ask, without being provocative, I just asked him, um, you know, why did you write down, you know, saying yes and prioritizing down? And he says, well, you know, I understand this whole thing about the importance of saying no, but sometimes my aha moment is sometimes it is in fact better uh, to say yes and prioritize down. 
And at the time, I didn't really understand it. Uh, you'll notice how he didn't say no. Did you see what he did there? He said yes while disagreeing, which is kind of interesting. And much, much later, I realized, you know, most of the things that we do in Agile when we're trying to get a group to work together, um, they're not about saying no. They're about figuring out what it is that we say yes to. How many of you have done dot voting? You know done dot voting? Okay, you know, dot voting is when you've got a long list of things that you could do and everyone puts the little dots on the cards and the ones that get the most dots are the ones that you do. Did anyone say no there? No, we said yes. We said, what are we gonna say yes to? And it turns out when we talk about doing more that matters, doing things that matter, what's really important is we need to figure out what to say yes to. Okay, and this is what I'd like to talk to you about. Now, this past year, um, I, I stumbled on product, what I now call personal agility about almost two years ago now. And this past year, I did a lot of research talking to customers first about, um, first about you know, the actual problem of doing things that matter. What do people want to achieve in, with themselves? What do they want to achieve with their lives? And then I did a second round saying, you know, I'm not paying enough attention to my, to my scrum training, to my daily business. So I went back and I talked about their challenges being agile. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you first what are the challenges of being agile in a company. Then we're going to connect it to our own challenges of doing, th doing more that matters. And then I think I have a simple framework which kind of lets you connect the dots between the two things so you can have more impact at work. So let's start looking at the challenges. Why do companies find it difficult to create high performance teams? And the number one reason that was identified by my customers, oh, and by the way, I talked to medium and large companies. These are people who've been sending people uh, to my classes over the years for several years. And you know what? They kept coming with the same problems. You know, I said, are we making any progress at all? And it turns out, and so when I talked to them, one of the big things, the big thing, is a lack of shared goals. We have, sometimes we have different parts of the organization and they have different goals and these goals conflict with each other. And sometimes just the different people uh, in the organization, everyone has their own agenda. They're not all pulling in the same direction. And so you get cor courses that kind of keep changing. The second thing was the lack, we, we've all heard about the Agile mindset and how Agile is a mindset, not a tool set. Uh, at this point, I would also like to remind you it's not a religion, okay? It's a way of thinking about the problem and a way of addressing the problem. And the organizations, they very often, they don't get this. And they give, at best, they give lip service to it, but then when they're under pressure, they do the wrong thing. And that Agile mindset kind of fades away. And I think both of these problems are related to a more fundamental problem, which is an inability to create alignment, an inability to agree on what really matters. Uh, it turns out there are a couple of other things. I'm not sure if this is a root cause or not. The ability to get things done. Okay, trust. How do you build trust with someone? The first thing that you do is you, you become a reliable partner. You say, I'm going to do something, and you do it. You say, I'm going to deliver something, and it works. And if you can't do that, why should they trust you? Well, it turns out a very common problem of agile teams is they're not able to develop, to deliver something that works at regular intervals. They're actually not capable of doing it, and just that causes them to fail. And finally, and this is about the mindset thing again, if we say these first four things are about creating uh, a situation, you know, creating the way we want to do things. The last one is about holding the mindset, okay? I, I see this over and over. People come into my classes and they leave my classes and they're really excited about changing, transforming their life situation and their work situation for the better. And then they go off and they hit the real world and the real world hasn't changed yet. And like sand in the gears, after a couple weeks, they're kind of back to where they were before. So how do we, if we have this new mindset, how do we hold the mindset? So I came up with a picture to kind of describe uh, what it is that we need to accomplish when we're trying to do an agile transition. Okay, and 
You know, so here you see this concept of the ability to get things done, the, the capability, this is the basic capability of getting things done. We talk about the need to be able to prioritize, to get the right things done. Now, it turns out this is, if you will, at the team level, but we've got another thing going on at the leadership level. Um, you're, the, you, every project actually has two projects. One is the thing that you're trying to create. Okay, you're trying to build something. But the other thing is the organization that produces the team. So every project is producing two products. The product that you're gonna sell or deliver to your customers and the organization that creates the product. And this is the job of your leadership. Okay, the mindset is the organization that creates the solution. Okay, and figuring out what is the right thing. This is what product ownership is about, but this is also what I mean about creating alignment. Creating alignment between what you're doing and what your customers want to have. That when you produce something, they say, yep, this is what I want, and they're happy, and they smile. Okay, now, you'll see that we've got a foundation of trust. Uh, if this talk were about agile transitions, I, I talk about how we go from command and control to trust, transparency, and frequent interaction. And that's what this is about. Now, I told you I did the same round of market research about what do people want from, you know, from being able to do more that matters. And it turns out it's almost exactly the same thing. Okay? We're trying to achieve some sort of goal. The way I, f I, I found it was phrased most succinctly is having an impact. That, that, that my actions actually mean something and that they do something. Um, the same basic skills are there. You need to be able to get stuff done. You need to be able to get the right things done. And you need to create alignment between what you're doing and what the people around you need. Okay? So what I'd like to do, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you a bit my story about personal agility. I'd like to give you three easy tools to help you understand and solve this problem. And then I'd like to connect the dots between the personal and the professional so you see how this will help you in, uh, in the real world, as we call it. So Piali gave, me, gave you a very, very brief introduction. My name is Peter Stevens. Uh, I'm a certified scrum trainer. Uh, today I'm actually going to pretend to be three people. And maybe you recognize these people, okay? Now, the first person, um, I'm going to stand over here. I'm going to call him me. Me, 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 me. It's all about me, okay? Anyone ever met people in the organization like that? Yeah, okay, sometimes they get called product owners, and sometimes they're chief product owners, and sometimes they're just chiefs. But the key thing that they want, they want more, and mostly they want it right now. So, and it seems to be the further away that they live, like you put an ocean between us and they get even more demanding, okay? So, my name is Peter, and I call myself me, and what I want is more. And this guy, these guys over here, well, this is myself. Now, particularly as a manager, you can say I can delegate work to someone else, but in real life, I do all the work myself, okay? I do the work of my life. And one of the things about myself is I am working really hard, okay? And I do my best with everything that I try to do. And that guy over there, that me, what does he want? More, 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 okay? So this brings you to the role of the uh, Scrum Master, my inner coach, okay? What do I have to do? I have to remind me to be nice to myself, okay? And we see this pattern in Scrum. The Scrum Master protects the team from everyone else. But actually, we need to apply this ourselves, to ourselves as well, to be nice to ourselves. Because hey, we do a lot of stuff. Very often it's different than what we set out to do, but we still got stuff done. So remember to be nice to yourself. Now, remember me is, worth, me is asking for more, and myself is saying, I'm doing the best I can. I, I need some time to eat and to sleep, okay? So what are we going to do? Well, this leads us to a really important question, which myself needs to ask to me from time to time. And that's, that's why we need I, the coach. What really matters? Of all the things I could do, which ones are really going to make a difference if I do them? And which ones are not going to make a difference if I don't do them? So 
this quest for figuring out what really matters, getting things done, this was the inspiration for my book. Uh, I started out with the idea, well, I didn't start out with the idea of writing a book. I started out with the idea of making my own life a little bit better, uh, having the feeling that um, I'm not just running in place and treading water. I mean, I'm one of those people. Do you know the difference between an employee and an entrepreneur? Um, an employee would rather work 40 hours a week. An entrepreneur would rather work 80 hours a week for himself than 40 hours a week for someone else. Okay, and I'm definitely on the entrepreneur side. I, I, I tend to work too hard. And I realized my business wasn't making any progress. It wasn't doing badly, but I wasn't in any better shape now than I was five years ago. And I started thinking, how can I change that? And that led me onto a long path. Um, one, of the more, one of the first and most interesting stops was when I met Maria Mattarelli in Portugal about a year and a half ago. Does anyone know Maria? Anyone take her to Agile marketing class? Yeah, she was one of the first scrum traders to latch onto it. And we eventually decided to write the book together. Uh, how to do more that matters. So maybe you'll recognize a couple of these patterns. Okay, these patterns came from my interviews with people around the world. The westernmost person lived in Vancouver. The easternmost person lived in Saigon, or Ho Chi Minh City as they now call it. And I, actually, I believe this story comes out of India. I have three bosses. All of them have lots of work for me to do, but none of them can tell me what to do next. So I can easily spend the whole day just talking with people, figuring out what I should be doing. Anyone recognize this pattern? Anyone have this pattern? No? A little bit? Okay. How many of you have more than one customer? How many of you have more than one project? Okay, how do you figure out which project you should be working on right now? That's, that's what this problem is about. Okay, how many of you just have too much to do? This was my case. No matter how, no matter how far I worked on that stack of papers, it kept growing. And not only that, the faster I could work down the papers, the faster the papers grew. Okay? And now we're back to yes and no. Okay? Yes and no is a scary thing. Now, I, got, I have a small, I, I have some bad news. That problem of yes and no doesn't go away. Okay? It's not really a question of whether you're going to say no. And here's why. Okay? Every one of us, given a week, a fixed amount of time, we have a certain amount of capacity, a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of ability to work. Now, some of us like to do things like eat and sleep, you know, and maybe take some time off from work for, for our own things. Now, I understand people here work pretty hard, but do people here like to eat and sleep? Does anyone not, you know, anyone skip the eating and sleeping part? None of you eat and sleep. Okay, well, maybe I should run. Maybe I should leave the arrow like this. Although the funny thing is, leaving the arrow like this doesn't change the problem. Because what happens is, no matter how much you can do, that me, remember me, me can always ask for more. Okay, now some of the things that we do, some of the things that we do are things that, that we say they matter. They mean something to us, for whatever reason. Okay, let's not ask the question, what matters just yet? We'll come to that later. But they mean something. And other stuff, well, the lean term, the technical term for this is waste. Um, and so basically every day, we have a choice in what we do. Okay, what we would like to have is we'd like to invest our capacity, and that capacity should serve something takes us to some place that we want to go. What's the worst case? Well, the worst case is kind of the opposite. Okay, and the random case is kind of the random case. Now, if you spend all of your time working on stuff, and you say, why am I doing this? Why should anyone care? Why do I care? Where does that leave you? Well, I don't think we want to go there. I think where we want to be, we want to be in this section. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a couple of tools to increase the possibility that the stuff that you do is gonna matter, especially to you, okay? Start with yourself. Remember what I have to do? I have to be nice to myself. So if someone has to be convinced that my work, my work matters, it's me, it's my inner, my own self. So, the first tool is to understand the challenge. What is it that we're trying to accomplish? 
I'd like to give you a simple framework for asking the right questions and an information radiator, at least one. We might have some more, but a minimum of one to help you understand the answers to your questions. So let's start with understanding the challenge. Now remember those three guys I told you about, me, myself, and I? Okay, well, one of them does the work. Okay, and that's important. We've got to be able to get stuff done. What me does is also important. Me sets priorities. Okay, now what's the role of the coach? Well, you need to, if, if you want to do stuff that matters, you need to ask yourself questions. One question is, am I doing, doing the right thing according to my priorities? And the other question is, have I set the right priorities? Okay, so you're challenging yourself or questioning yourself. Okay, and since it's just you and your life, we've got these three virtual people all crammed into one person, me, myself, and I, doing the work, setting priorities, questioning yourself. Okay? This is the, these are the basic skills to getting the right things done. Now, <coughs> so if we have these basic skills, now let's come back to the simple framework. Okay? Personal agility basically consists of six questions to ask yourself and one recurring event. Something to do at least once a week. Sometimes you might skip it, it's not the end of the world. You might do a lightweight version once a day depending on how focused you want to be. But basically there's, there's, one, uh, there's one event. Okay, so we start with the first question. First question is, what really matters? Now, the hard thing about this question is it's not at all the easiest one to answer, and especially when you're just starting out, you might not know the answer to this question. Um, the first person who talked to me about what I now call what really matters, she called it true north. What's your navigation star? What do you orient yourself around? And she told me about this. I thought, you know, this is really cool. She said everything she does is oriented to something, you know, oriented around true north. The three things that are most important in her life. And I had absolutely no idea what was my true north. I created this column in my Trello board. I called it True North at the time. Today I call it What Really Matters. And I had no idea what to put in there. And so I just left it there. I left it blank. And I went on with my life. And you know, the funny thing is, I made decisions about what I wanted to do without knowing what was important until one day it came to me. So the next question, what could I do this week? OK, so if we want to get things done, we need to keep track of those things. We can't let things fall through the cracks. We can't forget them. In getting things done, they call this closing the loop. Okay? If you want to write, if you want to get something done, write it down someplace where you won't forget it. Okay? Someplace where you'll come back to look at it again. Maybe you've noticed you've got something that you want to get done just before bedtime. You've got something you want to get done the next day. And you, you, you go to bed and you say, oh, I've got to do this first thing in the morning. And you spend the whole night and you don't really sleep because your brain is churning on, on what it is that you want to get done. And then at the middle of the, you know, at, after sleeping for two or three, or not sleeping for two or three hours, you wake up, you write it down next to your bedpost, and then you go to sleep and sleep like a baby for the rest of the night. Okay? This is because your mind doesn't have to churn. This is called closing the loop. Okay, so you got to remember what you're going to do. And on the... On the um, Oh, ha! Huh. I got this in the wrong order. I was talking. I got to. I got to step ahead of myself. Okay, let's come back here. Um, I, well, let me, well, let me finish the. Let's do this. So we talk about the what could I do question. Um, so you got this long list of things that you could do. Now remember, we said you've got more things to do than you have time to do them. So now we need to do a triage of all the things that I could do. Which of them are important? Why are they important? Well, because they serve something that matters. Some of the things that I could do are urgent. Why are they urgent? Well, you know, if I don't pay my phone bill by the end of the month, my phone might get turned off. So if, I, if it's urgent and I don't do it, a bad thing might happen. Okay? Uh, the, an important thing is something that it's helping me achieve an important goal. But if I don't do it, nothing bad's going to happen, at least not immediately. So for instance, I don't really have to write a chapter on my book this week. 
I mean, it would be good. It would help me get to my overall goal. And if I don't write the chapter, I'll never get to it. But whether I write the chapter this week or next week, it's really not such a big deal because nothing, I, there's no consequence except that my future benefit is pushed out. And so here we have the problem. The urgent says, take care of me, do me right away. Is the urgent also important? Well, the phone bill, probably. Um, the other things that pop up during the day, maybe, maybe not. So <clears throat> we look at what we could do. We look at what's urgent. We look at what's important. And then of all those things, what would I like to get done today? What is a reasonable expectation of what I can get done? Now, I skipped actually the second question. I want to come back to that one, which is, what did I do? Talk to me. What did I do last week? Now, those are, how many of you do Scrum or Kanban? How many of you are doing Scrum? Anyone doing Scrum? Okay, yeah, so you know, when I talk about yesterday's weather and I talk about philosophy, knowing what we got done in the last sprint gives us a hint as to what we can do in the, in the next sprint. Okay, well, in your life it's the same thing. First of all, knowing that you've got something done, this is a reason to pat yourself on the back and say, good job. Okay. Now, some of you are gonna say, but, 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 what I set out to do isn't what I plan to do. That's life. Life is what happens to you while you're planning to do something else. I planned to fly in on Tuesday morning so I would have a day to, uh, a day to recover and be free of jet lag. Unfortunately, something got in the way that I couldn't prevent and I came here this morning. Okay, got it at five in the morning. Did I want to do that? No. But on the other hand, I did make it to Bangalore. So it's not about being perfectly on schedule, it's about arriving, okay? And so wherever you arrived, pat yourself on the back. Now, if that's not exactly where you want it to be, when you want it to be there, well, think of yourself as like a, a ship on the ocean. You've drifted a little bit off course. What do you need to do? You need to get back on course. And that's what, that's, so this is recognizing where you went. This is saying, how do I get back on course? Am I on course? How do I get back on course? Okay, now we call this process celebrate and choose. Celebrate what you got done last week. Choose what you want to get done this week. Okay? Um, <coughs> so the idea is you come into the week, you got something done. You come into the week, you were somebody. You go through the week, that week should take you a step closer to who you want to be. That week should help you get some stuff done that matters, matters to you, so that you feel, I'm doing things that matter, I've got a positive feeling of, of accomplishment. Now, if you were counting, you will notice that those are only five questions. What's the sixth question? Well, the sixth question, this is the coach's go-to question. What do you do when you're stuck? And I have found it so helpful when I'm stuck just to ask myself the question, who can help? Now, that person might actually be someone who could help me on this problem. Uh, I've discovered that when I'm really procrastinating on something, when I'm really, I, I want to do it, but I can't bring myself to do it, sometimes the person who comes to mind is the person who's causing the problem. Okay, so exactly. And sometimes just thinking about that person unlocks something in you and you start to be able to think again. Okay, so whenever you get stuck, this is your go-to question, who can help? And it turns out who can help is a remarkably useful question because it also reminds you you're not alone. And sometimes you actually can ask for help and all of a sudden life is much easier. Uh, in German they say a shared burden is a lighter burden. Now, these are six questions. They're actually very simple questions. I mean, they're, 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 they kind of roll off the tongue once you, you've learned what they are. Um, nothing. It doesn't feel like we're doing rocket science. And so, remember I said six easy questions? Okay. Well, now we have an information radiator. Okay? Now, you guys are all doing scrum, so you know what a task board is, you know what a Kanban board is, you know what a story map is. These are all information radiators. They make it easy for us to see what the state is of our work. And in personal agility, we have a thing we call it the priorities map. Okay, and this is this is where you do your triage of what's important, your triage of what's urgent, 
recognize what you want to get done. So what I usually what I usually recommend as a place to start is the first column is the what matters column. Remember that was the one that I left blank for, for two months when I first heard about it? You might leave it blank for the first two months as well. Um, if, if you don't know, don't worry about it. Come back to it later, okay? But then we look at the question, what are the things you could do? The possibilities column, okay? I sort them by importance, okay? And then I'm gonna pull out the things that are urgent. Okay, things that really have to get done this week for one reason or another. Okay, now this gives me a first cut at prioritizing. What's the second cut? Well, remember I said I could do there. I've, I've got more work to do than time to do it. Okay, so let's pick out those things among the urgent and the important. Okay, and say what do I want to get done this week? Now, in reality, your boards will probably be a little bit more complicated than this. I usually put some personal Kanban between uh, what's important, what's urgent, and done this week. So I have a column, what do I want to get done this week? I have another column, what is the most important thing to get done today? Okay, and this is how I'm focusing down from lots of things to a few things to one thing, and that's what I work on. And when I get distracted, the telephone rings, my kids want something, this is, what I, this is what I go back to, okay? This is, this is the idea of the board is as a friend and helper reminding you what it is that you want to get done. Now, how do, you, how do you fill in this column on the left, the what matters column? Well, if you don't know, that's okay. Just start doing things for a while, and then after a while, things end up in the done column. And actually what I do now, I, I call this the breadcrumb trail. That's the other, that's the second artifact is the breadcrumb trail. Instead of just having one endless done column, I'll have a done column for every week or every month. Okay, and so the idea is you look at what you got done and then you look for patterns in what you got done. Oh, I did these things for my family. Oh, I did this for, you know, running my business. Oh, I did this for the change that I want to make happen in the world. And you start to recognize there are three or four things where you're spending most of your time. And that's your first iteration on what really matters. Okay? Now, you may you decide, you know, I'm spending an awful lot of time on stuff that doesn't really matter. Well, that's okay, because when you, then when you go through in the future looking at the what's important and the what's urgent, what are you gonna do? You're gonna put more importance on things that matter to you. You're gonna do less of things that don't matter. And this is how you do more that matters. Now, I started, um, I started doing this, I, I guess I started with my first experiments around, what was it, March of 2016. And I did a lot of experimenting and eventually had something that I was willing to share by uh, June or July. And this gentleman here, his name is Hardy Gudnowski, and at the time he was leader of Hubert's Human, Human Center Design for a well-known Swiss communications company. And I told him about this, and he says, oh, that's interesting. And I didn't hear from him for six months until one day I got a three-word email, okay, which is quoted here at the top. And this is when I started, uh, this is also about the time that I met up with um, uh, Maria, and this is when we started developing personal agility further. So this is how you can do more that matters, okay? Triage what you could do. Sort it by what's important, pick out the things that are urgent, pick a subset of what you need to work on, of what you want to work on this week. When you get blown off course, set a course back to your destination. How do we connect this to the situation at work? And so I want to uh, introduce a concept which builds on personal agility, which I call leadership agility. And Steve Denning, uh, you may remember Steve Denning, he was the author of the Radical Management book. Uh, he's now working on his latest book, The Age of Agile. And one of the things that he identified is that a very consistent pattern of agility is taking a big problem and making it into a little problem. He calls this descaling. The solution to our problems is not taking little solutions and making them into big solutions. It's taking big problems and making them into little problems. And I realized that Personal agility takes the problem of creating alignment and descales it. Instead of trying to create alignment in a whole organization, we create alignment between two people. 
Now, this alignment problem, this is a huge problem. I, I, I stumbled across an article, I think it was from HBR, a Harvard Business Review, and it said that if you take, if you ask the top 20 people in an organization, what are the five most important things they want to accomplish, or the organization needs to accomplish this year, you'll get at least 120 different answers. Okay, what's wrong with this picture? They don't have alignment. Now, when I went to create this presentation, I went looking for that article and I couldn't find it. You've heard, I, I couldn't see the forest because of all the trees. There were so many articles about this problem, and this is, a, this is another one. Uh, a third of the organizations don't have an agreed upon strategy, but even in the two thirds that do, only 14% actually know what it is. Okay? There is no alignment in the organization. This is the holy grail of how you make an organization move forward. Now, I have a very simple thesis. Okay? How many of you are familiar with Simon Sinek? Start with why? Okay? Well, I would, I would propose that if two people, if two people agree on what really matters, then we can say that they're aligned. Because if we agree on what really matters, the decisions that we take are going to be pulling in the same direction. Yes, we need to sync up from time to time. Okay, we need to make sure that we're still in alignment, but we're basically, we know where we're going, and that, that enables us to, to move forward together. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you how we can use personal agility to create that alignment. Now remember I talked about, talked about the three roles before, the three activities, and our friends, me, myself, and I, and I pretended that there were three people in one person. Well, what happens if there's two people? We've got these three people in two. That means we can take one of these roles and ask someone else to do them, okay? Now, for me, the first thing, uh, when I started doing personal agility and, and I started thinking of Scrum as a role model, I realized, uh, you know, product owner and Scrum master can't be the same person. Every, every Scrum trainer will tell you that. There are good reasons for that. And I decided to try the experiment asking my wife to be my scrum master. And some people looked at me when I, and I, they, they said, your product owner is going to be your scrum master, can that possibly work? And, and there were some challenges involved, but, but after, after a bump or two at the start, it was like, wow, we're getting things done. After eight weeks, she said, I feel like we've become a team. And we've been doing it now for about a year and a half, still with a smile, and we still really miss it when we don't do it. Okay, so the, the first way to create alignment is I'll call this a peer-to-peer -peer alignment, is let someone else be your personal coach. We call it the celebration master. Now, what if you don't set your own priorities? Well, you could designate that product owner role. How would you do that? Well, how many of you have a regular one-on-one -on -one meeting with your manager? You don't have a one-on-one? -on -one? Okay, yeah, most of us do. So, Mr. Manager or Ms. Manager, I'd like to talk to you about what really matters to our department this quarter and make sure that my work is, is in, in alignment. So, what are our top priorities? And so basically, you can ask, you don't even have to tell your manager what you're doing. You can turn your manager into your personal product owner just by asking the right questions. We call this managing your manager or better still, coaching your manager, okay? Now, what's interesting about this is unlike, say, Scrum or Kanban, which require a certain amount of agreement in the organization in order for you to do it, this you can just decide by yourself to do it. You don't need to ask anyone's permission, except to say, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Okay? So if you are, you know, if you are here, you could ask a colleague to help you. If you know, you're working for a manager, you can ask your manager you know, the questions. Um, and so basically what we can do is we can, leadership agility is basically using this one-on-one, -on -one, synchronizing with each other, and applying that up and down the organization, up and down and left and right. Now, I've been talking a lot, I've been sharing my experiences, but on the other hand, I come from far away, why should you believe me? And I did a lot of the, the validation for the personal agility course here in India, and I discovered some people in India are actually ask very, very critical questions. And so as Marie and I were writing the book, we realized what we really need are case studies. And on the other hand, we discovered people want recognition for the skills that they've developed. And so we decided to offer a recognition 
uh, on personal agility uh, for actual practitioners, people who are actually doing it. Now, unlike certification where you have to take a test, what we do is a coaching call. So we talk to you, and Maria, Maria has actually done the first coaching calls uh, with a total of 10 people talking to them about, you know, these are people who've taken my course, most of them. Some of them just read the book or read the guide. Uh, <coughs> um, Rene, um, he saw a presentation much like this one and said, this is cool. Uh, told his manager about it, says, this is just what you need. The manager said, I don't have time for that. Why don't you try it out? Okay, and he went off and did it himself. And he works, by the way, he's, he's the, um, uh, he's team lead for the Agile Transition Team in a uh, fairly large Swiss bank based in Zurich. And he you now has an internal blog about personal agility and his manager is now doing it. Um, you'll notice in the lower left hand corner, Piali, oh, there's Piali. Piali's there holding the stopwatch for me. But she was also the first person to be recognized as a practitioner. Now I'm not going to put any words into her mouth, but I'd like you to take the opportunity today to ask her about her experience with it. Um, in each of these cases, George, uh, this was the guy from Vancouver. He's originally from the Philippines, moved to Vancouver, is now a best-selling author on personal development. Okay, each one of these people has their story about how personal agility has, has helped them. And I'm just going to share a couple of the things that we want to put into the book. Absolute top list of benefits from personal agility, beating procrastination. Okay, now there's a whole long list, feeling better about yourself, understanding what really matters. I'm not going to say them all, I'm just going to let you read them as we click through them. Um, this was a very, very common one. Actually, I'm, I'm not sure if number seven is correct. A lot of people are saying they're much happier, feeling much more secure in their relations at home. They feel like they're more like a team. Fewer emergencies, few, fewer things. Uh, there was one person, he said, in my first week of doing personal agility, his name was Pino de Candia, he had 14 items in his urgent column. The second week he had 10, and then the third week he had it down to four. It's getting your life under control. <coughs> Okay, so how can you do more that matters? It's real simple. Once a week, sit down with yourself, maybe ask a friend or your spouse or someone at work to ask the questions to you. Ask yourself the questions, the six questions of personal agility. Visualize the answers in the priorities map. It's really quite simple. And if you wanna have more impact at work, also again, surprisingly simple. Just ask your stakeholders what really matters. Visualize the answers. Okay, and you'll probably discover that they don't agree, and so very, very gently facilitate a conversation to get them to agree on what really matters. And I think the best way to do that is to share the personal agility concept with them and help the people around you who are trying to do it. So I'll be leading a workshop on this on Tuesday. I'm not going to say too many words because I think the time is kind of up. Uh, the morning is going to be about personal agility, how to get things done. The afternoon is going to be leadership agility. How do you coach people? How do you build that alignment with your stakeholders? Um, how do you make sure that what you're doing is in alignment with what your stakeholders really want? Um, in the meantime, LinkedIn and Twitter, I'm very happy to connect. Please don't connect with me on Facebook. I don't really do Facebook. Um, we have uh, at mypersonalagility.org, we have an early readers club. You can join it for free. Uh, I'm expecting to start seeing chapters really quite soon, um, probably early January. We'll have an um, update on the first chapter and then be cranking out chapters fairly quickly. Um, there is a guide to personal agility which tells you in 16 pages how to do it, which you can download for free from the personal agility site. So you can join our early readers club. And so with that, I'm back to those words. Thank you very much. It has been an honor.